Welcome to the 32nd Fund for American Studies Annual Scholarship Dinner. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, we had our best fundraising total ever. We had a sold out ballroom here at the Four Seasons and it's because of you. So on behalf of my colleagues and the Board of the Fund for American Studies, thank you so much for your support. I particularly want to thank our leading sponsors, uh, the Louis DeJoy and Aldana Vosh Foundation from North Carolina, who is our dinner underwriter tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> the National Association of Wholesaler Distributors and uh, their team, their leadership, President Eric Hoplin, uh, thank you so much as well as our good friend, their past president, Dirk Van Dagen. Thank you for your support and help with the success of this dinner. I also want to thank Pinnacle West for being our reception sponsor tonight. Robbie Aiken and his people, thank you so much. Whenever you have a dinner involving four or five senators, it's a fluid program, so don't pay any attention to what this says. Uh, it's gonna be a fun night, and a night where we recognize some very important people for their contributions. But most of all, this is about the students. We have a lot of students here from around the world, actually, but around the United States, who are spending eight weeks in Washington this summer in our Live, Learn, and Intern programs, uh, learning about the values of the world's greatest anti-poverty pro program, the American Free Enterprise System. <laughs> These students are studying economics. They're interning throughout the nation's capital. They are uh, hearing from many, many interesting guest speakers, many of whom are alumni of our program, now in positions of influence. And so uh, it's a wonderful chance for many of them who are here tonight from our business program to have a chance to meet people from the corporate government affairs community. Uh, I will also ask that members of the Fund for American Studies Board of Trustees and Board of Regents please stand and we can say thank you for your leadership of the organization. And fin finally, I want to thank the members of our dinner committee uh, for your help in making this dinner such a success. So if you served on the dinner committee, I don't have time to read your names. They're in the program. Please stand so we can thank you. Well, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to a member of our dinner committee. Uh, please welcome Kirk Blaylock. Kirk. Hey, welcome. Great to see everybody. Um, sold out dinner. Um, biggest dinner for this annual scholarship dinner we've ever had. Um, raised almost $350,000 and over 400 people. So congratulations to you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very special event honoring our outstanding congressional and business leaders who have had significant positive impact on our nation and its young people. The funds that provide scholarships um, that bright young student leaders can attend, the TFAS Transformational Business and Government Relations Summer Program. Um, in the audience tonight, there are about 40 of these exceptional students, and I'd like to ask them to please stand at this time to be recognized, along with their program director, Lainey Carlton. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, J.D. Slattinger, who will uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening. J.D. is a member of the TFAST Summer Class of 2022. He's interning at the Healthcare Leadership Council, and he attends the Abilene Christian University. J.D.
you could uh, take off all non-religious headgear. And please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, next, um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Elizabeth Smith, um, who will give us tonight's testimonial invocation. Elizabeth is uh, TFAS summer intern in this program, and she's at the American Legion. She uh, attends the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Elizabeth. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Smith, and I'm an undergraduate student at UNC Charlotte. I have the opportunity of being a part of TFAS under the business and government relations track. It was an opportunity that I did not think possible, but the Lord was gracious enough in placing me here. I accepted a position to intern at the American Legion, a nonprofit organization that works to help veterans lead a meaningful and gainful life after their retirement from the armed forces. This internship continues to allow me to be a servant to those who serve our country, and I learned about public policy and the passion they have to serve our veterans. Over the course of my time at the Legion, I built a relationship with my supervisor, Quandrea Patterson. She is a woman of God who has mentored and encouraged me during my time in DC. The Legion is not just an organization that I intern for, but a family that accepted me with open arms. I'm incredibly grateful to call them my family and that would not have been possible if it was not for TFAS. The TFAS program has been a blessing not only to help my professional career, but to help me develop as a person. At the beginning of the summer, Chris Ullman spoke to us about courage and having the curiosity to ask questions. I have referenced that speech numerous times as opportunities arose for me to embody what it means to have courage. I've stepped out of my comfort zone and answered with a why not as I have embarked on many adventures throughout my summer. I have participated in many activities involving the complex world of politics. What I've learned is that courage is not limited to doing something like jumping out of a plane. But more importantly, courage is to effectively listen to different perspectives while holding tight to your own values and beliefs. My time in DC has allowed me to grow in all aspects of life and when I look back to the beginning of the summer, I can confidently say I am not the same person. This growth would not be possible if it were not for the generous people who sponsor students through scholarships. I am grateful to all scholarship donors, but I want to especially thank Louis DeJoy and Aldana Voss, who directly invested in my future and will forever be an integral part in my life. I am not my own, because I would not be standing here if you guys did not have generous hearts. Thank you, and thank you to TFAS for making this summer possible. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts and we thank you for your provision and faithfulness in making dinners like this possible. We thank you for the opportunity for fellowship and the chance to sit down and break bread with each other. May we engage in fruitful conversations and enjoy the opportunity of getting to know each other. I pray your blessings and favor upon those who have allowed us to come here with scholarships. Thank you for their generosity and willingness to invest in students so that we may attend TFAS and have a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I ask that you go before every person in this room as they continue through life and its complexities. In his name we pray, amen. Great. So as as uh, as Roger said, um, we're going to be a little flexible tonight. Um, we are lucky to have so many um, great uh, leaders with us this evening, and their schedules obviously uh, change. So um, we're going to go ahead and jump into the program. Um, it's my uh, it's my distinguished privilege this evening to introduce um, our first uh, introducer. 
Um, Robbie Aiken is Vice President of Federal Affairs for Pinnacle West Capital Corporation, which is headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, if you could just give me your attention for a few minutes, I would really greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I'll start over. But, uh, but Robbie, uh, many of you know, serves as Pinnacle West Chief Lobbyist. He's responsible for developing positions and policies on federal issues for energy, utilities, nuclear power, the environment, natural resources, renewables, and taxes. Prior to joining Pinnacle West, Robbie served in the Reagan administration as a Senate liaison and acting De Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Energy as Director of Congressional Legislative Affairs for the Department of Interior, and he began his career in Washington for Senator Paul Laxalt. I've known Robbie for 32 years, and most importantly, his son and my son were just on the Virginia State Championship lacrosse team, so uh, together, and won the state championship, so we've spent a lot of time on sidelines together. So inter to introduce our first uh, TFAS Congressional Award recipient is my friend Robbie Aiken. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see such a big crowd here with all the enthusiasm because we do have some star power for you. Welcome to the annual TFAS scholarship dinner. I did this dinner about 16 years ago when another senator from the state of Arizona was honored in this same capacity that we're going to honor Senator Sinema. That was Senator John Kyle. But it is my distinct pleasure to present this year's TFAS scholarship leadership award to my good friend very good friend, Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. We're honored to have you with us today. Her life story is an American dream and also a profile in courage. As some of you might know, she came from a humble roots, but through hard work, equity of opportunity, and education, she has achieved great success and reached the highest levels of public service. Representative, uh, excuse me, elected to the U.S. Congress back in 1912, 18, 2012. <laughs> Hang on a second. Starting at the age of 28, sorry, I got mixed up there. She was elected to the Arizona House of Representatives, then the Arizona Senate. She moved quickly up the ladder and then was elected to the House in 2012. And as the Washington representative of one of the largest companies in the state, I was lucky that Kirsten reached out to me on one of her first visits to Washington during the 2012 campaign. I found her engaging, friendly, smart, quite interested in getting up to speed on energy reliability and nuclear energy in the desert southwest. It's no surprise to me that Kirsten Sinema has strong convictions, and, it acts, and she acts on those convictions because I watched her during her three terms in the U.S. House of Representatives, when she time and again stood on principle and took courageous contrarian stands to her leadership on important issues that she believed in. For instance, in 2015, she was one of the few Democrats to vote for a Republican bill to repeal the estate tax, a very popular issue in Arizona among Republicans, moderate Democrats, and independent voters. In September of 18, she was one of the three Democrats to break with her party and vote to make individual tax cuts passed by the GOP in 2017 permanent. Courageous vote. According to the bipartisan index created by the Luger Center and the McCourt School of Public Policy, Senator Sinema's House voting record made her one of the most bipartisan members of the U.S. House during her tenure. It's not lost on us that she was like that. Senator Sim is known for accomplishing a lot during her power in personal relationships. The power of personal relationships has driven her. And yes, there, are political, there is political friction along the way. 
but Kirsten Cinema sticks to her guns to get the job done. She knows, like our old friend Johnny McCain used to say, this ain't beanbag. <laughs> we could use a lot more Kirsten Cinemas in the U.S. Congress. Tonight, the Fund for American Studies is proud to present its Congressional Leadership Award to Senator Cinema, a courageous leader and a role model for young people. And all the service to our nation, we want to thank you. And now I'd like Roger and our other presenters to come up for the presentation of the award. Well, thank you so much, Ravi, for that incredible um, introduction and those very kind words. It's been an honor and privilege to be your friend for so many years, and I look forward to many more years of our friendship. He was just getting started eating. I get it. Um, thank you so much to the Fund for American Studies for this great honor. It is such an incredible privilege to be with you all this evening, and I share in my honor and support of each of the scholarship recipients who are here this evening. We are so incredibly proud of you. I also want to say congratulations to the fellow award recipients here this evening. Jade West, who is a mentor to so many who are here tonight. It's wonderful to see you. And my colleague and friend, Senator Pat Toomey. You know, Senator Toomey has been a critical partner on the work that we've been doing and bipartisan efforts in the Senate for many years including working closely together on our infrastructure law last year, and just recently, the passage of our historic bipartisan Safer Communities Law. I am so thankful to Pat for his continued leadership and commitment to democracy, and I'm honored to be recognized alongside him today. I will miss Pat when he retires and leaves the United States Senate. He's an incredible leader. And it's wonderful, yeah, let's clap again for that, yeah. <laughs> As I arrived here this evening, I was just thrilled to see so many students of the Fund for American Studies. You know, each of you here tonight represent future leaders in business and government. The lessons that you learn through your participation in TFAS programs about the importance of protecting our constitutional democracy, ensuring ethical behavior, and preserving free enterprise and encouraging economic growth, these skills will set you up for success for years to come. As most of us know this evening, tonight's event raises scholarship funds for students across the country to come to Washington and receive this one-of-a-kind education about the intersection between business and government. The mission of this organization is personal for me. As Robbie mentioned, education and hard work were my keys to opportunity. I went to college with both an academic scholarship and a Pell Grant. My family couldn't afford to pay for college. And I know how critical financial support can be to ensuring that young Americans can reach their dreams. And here, the Fund for American Studies teaches students from all across the ideological and political spectrum how to discuss and debate ideas with respect and with understanding, something that is too often lacking in today's political climate. Unfortunately, these days, there's intense pressure on members of Congress to spend time and energy on every scandal, every insult, every tweet, every partisan fight, and it can be easy to get distracted. But what's harder is ignoring that chaos, getting out of our comfort zones, and bringing people together to build new coalitions and to deliver lasting results for everyday Americans. I serve as Arizona's senior, oh. <laughs> I serve as Arizona's senior senator. And when I ran for this position, I promised to be an independent leader, that I would put the needs of Arizona ahead of the desires of either political party, and that I would work with literally anyone to get things done for my state. 
that approach has been successful and it helped deliver the historic bipartisan infrastructure investment and jobs law. Our <laughs> it's the transportation table back there, I think, yeah. <laughs> Our law makes once in a generation investments for everyday Americans, from better roads to stronger electric grids to cleaner water to faster internet in more places. These investments will make America stronger and safer and also power new opportunities in cities and towns all across our country. But our law also creates jobs and protects small businesses, encourages economic growth without raising taxes on everyday American families. You know, for decades, American infrastructure has been crumbling. And despite the fact that it was infrastructure week for years on end, <laughs> our progress was continually blocked by partisanship. But beyond our law's transformative investments in our economy, our law now also provides a roadmap to make Washington work better for everyday Arizonans. You know, recently we've been asked by pundits and politicians to accept a new standard, a standard by which important policy can only come together on a party line. But rather than feeding our divisions with extreme rhetoric, these all or nothing purity tests and personal attacks, the senators that I was honored to work with who negotiated our infrastructure and jobs law, we showed America something different. Our approach in writing the law was grounded on the issues that matter most to everyday Americans and a sincere desire to bridge our differences and forge common ground around our shared values. So we shut out the noise from the extremes. We refused to demonize each other when we had disagreements. And instead we focused on finding and identifying creative solutions and finding common sense compromises to get the job done. So it was these values of collaboration and focus. It also guided our recent work to pass into law our Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Historic legislation passed just two and a half weeks ago that will save lives, help children learn and grow in healthy and supportive environments, and make our communities safer and more vibrant places. You know, for too long, political games in Washington on both sides of the aisle have stopped progress towards protecting our communities and keeping families safe and secure. Common sense proposals by both parties were tossed to the side by partisan lawmakers who wanted to choose politics instead of solutions. But our communities deserve a commitment by their leaders to do the necessary but hard work of putting aside the politics identifying the problems that need to be solved and working together towards common ground and common goals. You know, there have been other bipartisan successes this Congress, from long-awaited and necessary postal reform to, su <laughs> I didn't even know you were gonna be here. <laughs> to support for Ukraine in its fight against the dogmatic Vladimir Putin. <laughs> and his corrupt cronies in Russia. The truth is that progress can happen when you ignore the cable news drama and you focus on results. The reality is, is that Americans are far more united than today's politics would have you believe. Just ask our constituents in Arizona, in Pennsylvania. They know, they want to see in Washington people coming together. They'll tell you what they want. They want to see people who have an ability to work together, who can solve problems, and who can help them build better lives for themselves and for their families. That's what Americans want. So bringing people together to build new coalitions and deliver lasting results isn't easy. And I'll tell you from personal experience, it won't always make everyone happy. <laughs> but there are too many talking heads 
and members of the Beltway political class who were betting against these bipartisan successes. But working across the aisle and building friendships with those with whom you have differing opinions, it may not fit in today's Washington. And as you've seen, if you don't fit in today's Washington, they wanna kick you out. But we weren't elected to play politics. We were elected to achieve lasting results. We were elected to solve the problems that matter most to everyday Americans. So let's keep doing the work. So I wanna thank each of you here today for your contribution to the Fund for American Studies because the work that you're doing here is creating our next generation of young people who I hope to see standing here today standing here in the future to celebrate, to promote, and to cultivate bipartisanship. Our country desperately needs you. And I pledge to keep working with each and every one of you, with Arizonans back home, and with my colleagues in the Senate to maximize opportunities, to deliver these lasting solutions for our country, and to keep paving the path for each of the young people who are here today so that you may stand in this seat one day and claim these same bipartisan results and greater for our children and our grandchildren in this future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Senator Sinema. That was spectacular. Um, appreciate it, um, and congratulations on the award. Um, I'm honored to introduce our next guest who really needs um, no introduction. He is arguably, at least in my book, the most successful Senate Republican leader in American history. Um, when we called him uh, to ask him to introduce Jade West, he immediately said yes, because he knows how important our honoree is to this community and to the Republican Senate um, as the time she served there. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Leader Mitch McConnell. Thank you very, very much, uh, Kirk. I uh, kind of hated for you to stop. <laughs> it's really my honor to be here tonight to uh, introduce a really special person. Um, you guys know how long I've been around here, right? You may not know that my real first break in politics was my internship with Henry Clay. <laughs> but Jade actually got here before me. <laughs> and um, I might, it won't surprise you to know I'm not routinely doing these kind of things in the evening, so, uh, I'm here because I think Jade is something really special. And uh, I'm thrilled that she's receiving this recognition. And as I said, it's just an honor to be here to shine the spotlight you know, on one of the most essential behind the scenes players in Washington. As I just suggested, Jade and I arrived in the Senate around the same time back in the mid-1980s. As I said, she actually beat me by a couple of years. And ever since then, ever since then, across a remarkable 40-year run and counting, Jade has been an indispensable player 
in practically every major policy debate relating to American free enterprise and prosperity. Over two decades in the Senate, Jade evolved into the very archetype of an effective staff leader. Reliable, persistent, smart, but humble. And for those of you who know her well, a genuine pleasure to be around. She served as staff director for the steering committee, then the policy committee. Among many other things, she was the tip of the spear in the fight against Hillary Care back in the 1990s, for those of you who weren't born yet. <laughs> whatever the battle, whatever the issue, Jade's ability to build a coalition, create a strategy, and lead the charge was invariably without peer. Then 20 years ago, Jade took her talents to the outside, to the wholesale distributors. That's been a perfect match. America's wholesalers are the often unheralded engine of all kinds of American progress, just like Jade herself. In this role, Jade kept right on as a pivotal player. She's one of the preeminent elder stateswomen in Washington on the side of creating American jobs and American prosperity. Just one example, if memory serves, way back in 2004, the long shot campaign of a young upstart named John Thune got a huge early boost when Jade hosted a coalition in her office to meet the congressman and began deputizing folks and of course, giving orders. <laughs> year after year, from Obamacare to the historic 2017 tax reform to helping police the worst policies and personnel of the current administration, from detailed policy fights to political messaging battles, Jade has somehow just kept getting even more effective and even more dedicated. And her total commitment to principle has never never ever dim. So, I'm honored to call you a friend. We've been in more foxholes together <laughs> than I can remember or count. And look, I think the best way to sum it up, the country has been better for her work. So Jade, congratulations on this 2022 Business Leadership Award. I can't think of anybody who would deserve it more than you. I honestly don't quite know what to say. Um, as Senator McConnell has noted, I did a two-decade stint in the United States Senate, working, by the way, for all those who find criticism of Congress a passing fancy, working for some of the most honorable and noble people I have ever had the honor to work with in my life. And you would think that the one thing I would have learned in that 20 years was that Sometimes in the Senate, you just have to talk. Maybe a lot, but you have to talk. 
and I am tonight almost at a loss for words. I've introduced a few senators uh, over my 40 years in Washington. I've occasionally engaged in a little bit of minor hyperbole or exaggeration in those introductions. <laughs> I have never been introduced by a senator engaging in that same exaggeration and hyperbole. <laughs> and I don't know what to tell you, but this is just backwards. <laughs> and I'm also humbled by the number of my friends and colleagues in the audience tonight. I truly appreciate your coming, appreciate your support for TFAS, which is, of course, why we're all here. I did have one very close friend in the tax community hint that maybe some of the attendance tonight wasn't nearly so much for me, but because there are going to be a few senators here, including some rather critical to the ongoing tax debate. I don't know that that's true. I don't know. Um, but you never know. Um, I'm also honestly a bit disconcerted by the honor. Um, I don't think of myself, I don't consider myself a business leader. I've never done any of the things that a business leader does. I'm just one of the many of us doing what we can and the best we can to support and encourage free enterprise. In my case, to advocate for our member companies so that they could run their businesses the way they see fit, benefiting them, vetting their employees, vetting, benefiting their communities with as little interference from government as we can get away with. I've never built a business. I've never taken risk as an entrepreneur. I've never devised or invented the next great widget. I've never managed a big payroll. But I think I'm here tonight, and I'm going to echo a little bit of Senator Cinema because of people who did all those things. My dad, my dad's dad, was a, an automobile mechanic in West Texas. His mother took in, his grandmother took in work as a seamstress to help make ends meet. My mother's dad was a wallpaper hanger and painter in Cleveland. Her mother had a full-time job raising eight kids. My mother and dad worked hard together to build something better. Oh, I shouldn't have done it that way. Not, not build back better. <laughs> Build something better. And at the end of my dad's long career, he was the general sales manager of a multi-billion dollar international manufacturing company from an automobile mechanic. And the free enterprise system and the economy that, that we all here to support opened doors for them. They were there, it was there, when the opportunity to, to get ahead, to build, to grow for them. Isn't that what the American dream is really all about? The opportunity to succeed? I, th I think that's kind of why we're all here. Business is fundamental to that dream, and the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well in the United States today. The Census Bureau recently reported that despite the pandemic, 5.4 million new business permits were, applications were filed in 2021, 5.4 million. While a significant number of small businesses, startup businesses don't succeed, those that do, the risk takers, create jobs, they build an economy, they create opportunity. The, the rather astounding number of startups also makes another point. Business is not only, and even not mainly, the large corporations that get most of the attention, <laughs> whether they want it or not, they get most of the attention. But there are 4,000 publicly traded companies in the country today. There are 32 million plus businesses. Those that are not publicly traded are privately held, family owned, entrepreneurs. They are the, they're in the neighborhood. They make things, they move things, they provide services, and they are the engine, they are the engine of not just American economy but American prosperity. I once asked <laughs> I once asked a group of my member company executives if they did stuff in their communities. What do you do in the communities? What do you do in your neighborhoods? And the answers were, I guess shouldn't have been surprising to me, but in a way they were. They I'm gonna read this because this I just made notes of everything that they said. They, they fund the building of public parks, school stadiums, playgrounds. They support local school athletic teams, give employees time off for volunteer work, donate products to local causes, sponsor community events, create local scholarships. And I asked them, what do you do to publicize these community things that you do? What do you do to make people know about them? 
to at least make sure your own workers know about them. And they looked at me like I'd asked them a question in a foreign language. The answer is, not much. They don't do it for recognition. They don't do it to be recognized. They do it because it's part of their culture. They do it because they are just good American business people. And American businesses are among the unsung heroes in the country, um, not just providing jobs, but allowing other people to do other things. Winston Churchill once famously said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others that have been tried. The same is true of capitalism, which is an integral part of democracy. Capitalism isn't perfect, but it has lifted more people out of poverty than any other system on earth. It provides Americans. It provides Americans not only the opportunity to reap the benefit of their own labor, but to contribute the benefit of that labor to others. Individuals, American individuals, bequests, foundations, and corporations gave an estimated $471 billion to American charities in 2020. And when there are floods, hurricanes, anything anywhere in the world, Americans and American businesses are the first ones to step up to help. It's an instrumental part, business is, capitalism is, of the American exceptionalism that we celebrate, that TFAS celebrates, that TFAS trains thousands of young Americans to continue to celebrate. Sadly, and this is, this is the point where I didn't know what to quite do with these comments, but I just figured I would do it anyway. Many Americans increasingly today are down on their own country, including its businesses, including its revered institutions. In my five, and I have been here longer than you, Senator McConnell, in my, in my five plus decades of adult life, I've seen America go through tough times. The, the, the aftermath of, of the Vietnam War, the, white wa the Watergate tread scandal that brought down the president, the, the financial collapse in 2008, which killed the dreams of, of so many Americans. But in each of those times, American fundamentals were still there. There was no disbelief in America. There was just a problem that America was going through that we would solve. I'm not sure that's as true today, certainly, as it was then. George Gilder wrote that nothing is more deadly to achievement than the belief that effort will not be rewarded, that the world is a bleak and discriminatory place in which only the predatory and the specially preferred can get ahead. That is not my country, it's not our country, but that is the way too many people today describe our country. That makes what TFAS does, is doing, and has done so critically important for us, um, for, for us elder stateswomen. I think McConnell called me an elder stateswoman. Did you call me an elder stateswoman? <laughs> I think you did. Um, but T, what TFAS is doing is, doing is so important. TFAS's mission is to create courageous leaders. And today a courageous leader not only has to have a firm and fundamental belief in, in the principles that make us great, you also have to have the ability and the willingness to listen. And here I'm, I'm echoing Senator Sinema yet again. It takes courage to listen to what the other side is saying. It takes courage to debate and discuss, those willing to debate and discuss, and that's probably as important as anything that I could say today to the, to the TFAS interns that are here. And I went through a whole bunch of interns in my 20 years on the Hill, and they are an instrumental part of, of Washington writ large. But have the courage of your convictions. Believe in the fundamentals of America that you are advocating for. Have the courage to listen to people who don't agree with you without considering them your enemy. Let's terminate the cancel culture in this country as in a complete infringement on everything we believe in, in free speech. <laughs> so in, in all of my long years, it is dispiriting to see what's happening in our country today, but I do not believe this will stand. I believe the fundamentals of free enterprise and a government responsive to its people will outlast, outshine, and outperform 
the naysayers. Part of that is because of what you are doing and what others like Chief Bass is doing, and it is so important. The pendulum has swung so far to the left and opened the door for the naysayers. Chief Bass, the interns, and all of the young Americans who believe in America will swing that pendulum back so that Ronald Reagan's city on the hill never ceases to shine. I am honored to be honored tonight, but the honor truly goes to those of you who are here tonight, both learning and studying under the PFAS program, to those of you who have generously donated to the scholarships, and to all that you will continue to do. So I am grateful and humbled, um, and thank all of you for what you are doing um, to help keep America what it was and is. Thanks, Jade. Congratulations. Uh, please enjoy your dinner. We'll be back in a little bit uh, for the next award. So thank you. Like most nonprofit organizations, the Fund for American Studies relies on volunteers for much of what it does to accomplish its mission. Those volunteers contribute in many ways, including as donors, intern sponsors, speakers, mentors, and recruiters of students, outstanding students. Among these many volunteers are alumni who are truly giving back because the TFS experience was transformative in their lives, help, helping put them on a career path or influencing their worldview. Tonight, we recognize one such individual with our annual Kevin Burkett Alumni Service Award. In 2008, this annual award was named in honor of the late Kevin Burkett. Kevin set, set the mark when it came to volunteering. When he passed away at a young age on September 1st of 2007, TFAS lost a friend with an ever-present smile, a caring na nature, and a passion for the TFAS mission. His presence is missed to this day by all those at TFAS who had the opportunity to work with him. The recipient of our Kevin Burkett Award this year is Andrew Paolani, who is the embodiment of this award's purpose. Andrew attended the TFAS journalism program in 2008, interning at Talk Radio News Service. In the years since then, Andrew has volunteered for TFAS in almost every capacity possible. He has helped recruit students as an alumni ambassador. He served as a mentor to countless students, hosted career exploration talks, and participated in our alumni roundtable networking events as a discussion leader, most recently last night. Whenever our TFAS staff needs a reliable alumnus to speak to students, Andrew is often the first call they make because they know he'll say yes. His willingness to share his time and expertise with any TFAS student who crosses his path is, is, is impressive. Andrew truly embodies the idea of the TFAS lifelong journey. After his summer in the program, he was selected as a 2011 year-long TFAS public policy fellow. Andrew also served on the TFAS Alumni Council from 2012 to 2018. It's a rare occurrence to attend one of our events and not find Andrew in attendance and with a smile on his face. Notably, he hasn't missed a year since completing his TFAS program in giving his financial support to the organization. In fact, he gives multiple times during the year. And as a representative of Pharma, he also supports us through the association, so we're grateful to Pharma for your support tonight as you do every year. Thank you. Giving to TFAS every year is a great example for all of us, right? Right? <laughs> Andrew uh, is also quick to promote his fellow TFAS alumni, uh, often bringing to our attention accomplishments of his classmates so we can highlight them in our alumni newsletter. Well, uh, I could go on with other things he, Andrew has done for us, but 
We couldn't have chosen a more deserving recipient of this award. So on behalf of the board and my colleagues at TFAS, I'm pleased to present Andrew Pawlani with the Kevin Burkett Alumni Service Award. Andrew. Wow, thank you so much, Roger. That was a uh, really um, wonderful introduction. And I, I really am so honored to be receiving this award this evening, to be with so many distinguished leaders throughout the room, especially uh, Senator Sinema, Senator Toomey. Um, most importantly to me personally, I'm also happy to be uh, receiving this award with my partner in the audience, JJ, I love you. Um, Thank you. Um, you know, my, my journey began with TFAS 14 years ago, and coming from a small town, not knowing what the summer would bring, I learned early that with TFAS, you just have to say yes. You want to go to a TFAS lecture? Say yes. You want to meet other TFAS students at a Nationals baseball game? Say yes. You want to go to the Tombs Bar in Georgetown after a long day of interning and then evening classes? Say yes, but maybe only have one beer. <laughs> now, while the program's values have stuck with me, it really is the people that I treasure most. And those people are today doing big things. One was just named the co-host of NPR's All Things Considered. Another writes for The Onion. Another leads a charity doing communications in the United Kingdom. Another just wrote a book with her brother about raising awareness about mental illness. My classmates have all done and continue to do big things, and I keep in touch with many of them. In fact, I've actually been to three TFAS weddings. While the people I met along the way I treasure, TFAS values have been pillars of my own professional growth. Individual liberty, personal responsibility, my own favorite, and economic freedom. These values I hold dear. To be fair, my own political identity has changed since I did the TFAS program, and that's okay. Here's why. TFAS is not tied to political parties, but rather a mission to fight for common sense principles, which have been the bedrock of our democratic republic. In my own professional life, these principles help me to lead scientific and innovation communications at the Pharmaceutical Research Manufacturers of America, otherwise known as Pharma. We represent some of the leading companies. I'm truly honored to do this important work and to be with many of my distinguished colleagues this evening. I'm proud of the work that our industry has done to deliver new treatments and cures. Most importantly, I'm proud of the work that we have done to fight COVID-19, allowing us to be here together in person. Let's give it up for science. A personal hero of mine is the late President George H.W. Bush. His, his uh, values of kindness, dignity, and respect go hand in hand with my love of this organization. As Senator Sinema said, we all know there's a lot of noise going on in politics these days. TFAS does none of these things. Rather, TFAS thoughtfully engages with all perspectives. Most importantly, they do so with respect. Now, I'd be, reminisce, or I'd be remiss, I should say, if I didn't make time uh, of this moment for a CTA. If you do advocacy, you know a CTA means call to action. My CTA for all of you this evening is the following. Engage with TFAS, host an intern, mentor a student, participate in events, and as Roger said, 
If you can, make a donation. Operators are standing by. <laughs> Not really, but you know the drill. Go to tfast.org. Please support this wonderful organization if you can. In closing, I simply want to say to TFAST, thank you. I never thought I'd be here on this stage accepting this award. I'm so honored to be doing so. Thank you. Congrats. Uh, thanks again. Uh, we're back for um, our final Congressional Leadership Award presentation. Um, I have the honor of introducing last year's um, uh, a winner of the TFAS Congressional Award, Senator Dan Sullivan. Um, as you know, he has a storied career, uh, whether that's his current role as in the United States Senate or Alaska Attorney General or Director of the White House National Security Staff in previous administrations. But I thought I'd give you a sense of more of the person of Dan Sullivan um, when uh, he was recently uh, at home and, um, and posted this, because I think it sort of strikes the essence of who Dan Sullivan is. I recently ran my Marine Corps physical fitness test. One thing is certain, I'm getting older, slower, and weaker, but I'm still working it. 19 dead hang pull-ups, 100 crunches in two minutes, and 24, 13, three-mile run. Despite the disappointment of the slowest three-mile run time of my entire Marine Corps career, there is nothing like spending the morning with the few and the proud as a reminder of one of the many things that makes our country so great. Every one of the Marines I spoke with after the test was doing something meaningful and impactful for their Corps and for our country. It reminds me of President Ronald Reagan's famous quote, some people wonder all their lives if they've made a difference. The Marines don't have that problem. My friend, Senator Dan Sullivan. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kirk. Uh, I didn't know you were reading my Facebook page, but I appreciate that. <laughs> and it's been a great evening tonight, and we still have one incredible awardee, my good friend uh, Pat Toomey. We've heard from Leader McConnell. Uh, by the way, Jade West, I mean, I was up here, I'm like, damn, she should be a U.S. Senator, huh? I mean, that was... <laughs> that was a... That was a great speech, and Robbie, Andrew, other remarks. You know, Senator Sinema w uh, was up here. There's a lot of bipartisanship that goes on in the Senate. You should know this. I had a meeting with her, one-on-one -on -one meeting with a senior Biden administration official on mental health issues for teenagers. Serious issues. She and I are working on those, and it, yesterday was her birthday. And I had uh, just been home in Alaska. I was out salmon fishing like we do in Alaska, and Brought a lot of salmon back with me, and I presented her a beautiful sockeye salmon with a bow on it as a special birthday gift. And she looked at me and she's like, this is a dead fish in a bag. <laughs> Isn't that like a, some kind of mafia warning or something? <laughs> and I said, no, it's a salmon from Alaska, man. But anyways, sometimes there's a disconnect. But... Um, before I get into Pat Toomey, one of my favorite U.S. Senators, literally, who's done so much, is going to be missed tremendously. I just want to say a word about TFAS. And I think we all know that in many ways, and Jay did a great job of mentioning it, we are at an inflection point for a lot of reasons. The battle of big ideas, particularly as it relates to forms of government is once again upon us both domestically and internationally. Skepticism about democratic institutions and free markets abound both at home and abroad. And I fear some of our young people across the country are starting to lose faith or not understand the democratic institutions and principles that we have been blessed with in this country and the principles upon which our great nation were founded. And that's why TFAS's work is so important. So how about a round of applause for them again? Really important. 
And that's why you're focused not only on limited government, free enterprise, but what also TFAS calls the need for, quote, honorable leadership is so crucial. Honorable leadership, more than anything else I can think of, can cut through the cynicism and draw our young people to the importance of principled public service based on these critical principles that made our country great. In my career in the Senate and the Marine Corps, the firsthand impact of what an honorable leader can have and do, especially for America's young people, is you see it everywhere. And tonight, we are honoring, TFAS is honoring, with its Congressional Leadership Award, my friend Pat Toomey, who I think epitomizes honorable leadership and the principles that TFAS stand for, limited government, free enterprise, probably more than any other U.S. Senator serving right now. Pat and I have worked closely throughout the years, most recently on legislation that will work to democratize our financial institutions. You're never too old, by the way, everybody here, particularly the students, you're never too old to have a mentor. When I got to the Senate, Pat Toomey became one of my mentors. I was very honored by that. And for me and so many senators, Democrats and Republicans, he has been a leader, a principled intellectual leader on so many issues, so many, but in particular, those issues that we need expertise on more than ever, fiscal discipline, finance, our economy. The host of Bloomberg TV on a show recently said this about Pat, and I'm quoting, the most supple mind on economic dynamics, financial dynamics, the U.S. economy, currency swaps, and derivatives in the entire U.S. Senate. That's Pat Toomey. And to our young people tonight, that basically means that when it comes to money in the economy, in finance, this senator really knows his stuff. And to the older people, this is so true about Pat Toomey. You might remember that ad many, many years ago, E.F. Hutton, right? I can say this because I've seen it throughout my entire career in the Senate. When Pat Toomey speaks, people really listen particularly in the United States Senate. Pat learns some of what he knows at Harvard, but in my view, hopefully not too much of what he knows from Harvard, when he received his undergrad education there, and of course, during his incredible service, 23 years in the US Congress. But most of, most of all, he has also had lived experience, as the kids would call it. Pat was one of six children, his father was a union worker who laid underground cable, who was also a U.S. Marine. His mother worked as a part-time secretary at a Catholic church. Pat himself has been in the financial sector, was a small restaurant owner. He ran what I think one of the best organizations, thought organizations, action organizations in D.C., the Club for Growth, on many of these issues, a great organization. And he has never lost his sense of humor. I was part of a group of senators in 2016 on a bus for two days with Pat going around Pennsylvania campaigning for his reelection. We had a blast. And you know you never lost your sense of humor if you can laugh at being skewered on Saturday Night Live, as he has been as well. Speaking of priorities, and I know he has these as his ultimate priorities, his family, his kids, I know his daughter Bridget is here with us tonight, so Bridget, thank you and the whole Toomey family, family for sharing your father with us and with our nation and with Pennsylvania. Pat is going to leave a huge empty space in the U.S. Senate, and I mean this, on our institution uh, when he leaves, but he, more than anyone I know, 
is so deserving of this honor tonight. Pat, thanks again for your honorable leadership, mentorship, inspiration. You've provided so many. It's uh, been incredible to have you as a colleague and friend in the U.S. Senate. Everybody, Pat Toomey. Well, my goodness, um, thank you very, very much. Dan Sullivan, thank you for that extraordinary uh, introduction. That was far too generous. Um, you know, at the risk of sounding like a mutual admiration society, let me tell you, um, I think the world of Dan Sullivan, uh, he very quickly, when, he, when upon arriving at the Senate, clearly became a star. He is a star within the Republican conference. He is a star in the United States Senate. And it's, it really is the combination of attributes and character traits that he brings to this job. His background is amazing, although he does have the same educational handicap that I have at Harvard. But he's been recovering from that pretty well. Um, but, you know, his dedication to service is unparalleled. He's a Marine Corps Reserve colonel. He's got the experience of having been an attorney general of his state. He served so admirably in the Bush administration. And in addition and separate and apart from just my fondness and friendship with Dan, I look to Dan, as the entire Republican Conference does, especially on issues regarding energy and national security, two areas that I know are close to his heart. And given his tremendous capabilities, he has tremendous expertise. Um, it's something that happens in the Senate. You, you look around and you, you see if you identify somebody who shares your core values, your core principles, kind of views the world the way you do, but has a level of expertise that you don't have. And Dan Sullivan provides that for so many of us, certainly for me, and certainly in both the energy and the national security space. But I'm having a lot of fun working with you in the securities right now. So I will welcome you into my neighborhood of <laughs> the security space, Dan. Um, Jade West, I don't know where Jade went. There's Jade. Um, I missed your speech, and I'm going to have to find it on YouTube because you have been getting rave reviews. I'm sure it's gone viral by now, but I'm a big fan of Jade, and I'm grateful for your friendship and your support over the years and your advocacy for freedom and for economic freedom. And sure, we can give Jade a round of applause. <coughs> um, I. Uh, by the time I got here, I had a, a prior uh, engagement this evening. By the time I got here, Kirsten Cinema had already left. Um, but I know she was uh, awarded. She was an honoree tonight as well. And I want to say a, a couple of words about Kirsten Cinema. Um, so obviously, we're from different political parties, and there's a lot of policy that we see very, very differently. Um, but I have so much respect for her. I have a tremendous amount of re respect for her. Um, she is a very rare creature in the United States Senate in the sense that she's extraordinarily effective and she completely shuns the spotlight. That's an unusual combination. I think Dan can attest to that. She's effective because she's very smart. She's a totally straight shooter. You know, um, you're going to be shocked to learn this, but in my line of work, there are some people who are not exactly straight shooters. It happens. No, it not happens. It does. But not with her. You, you totally know where she's coming from, and her word is as, as good as it can be. And she's smart. She's politically sophisticated. She gets the challenges that we all face. And she spends her time working hard to bridge gaps. So she's the person in the back room that you're not hearing from on the cable stations, but she is negotiating the deal on whether it's gun safety or whether it's infrastructure. And, you know, we're not all going to agree on all of these things. But she's trying to make progress, and she's a great senator. So I'm grateful to be honored <laughs> with her. 
and, and, and let, me, let me say a huge, um, a huge thank you to all of you for this honor. It, it, it means a lot to me. Um, I, uh, I get great advice uh, from my staff, and one of the things they like to remind me on a regular basis, including this evening, just before I got up here, one of my senior staffers took me aside and said, remember, Pat, just because you can't give a good speech doesn't mean you can't give a short speech. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, Theo. Um, but I do want to make a couple of points here, because the more I, I, I study you guys, the Fund for American Studies, a few things stood out to me. One is the tremendous reputation you have for the work you do, for the experience you give to young people, for the instilling the values that, that are so, so important to me, for really helping to produce leaders who go on to do great things. I, I'm, I'm a big, big fan of that part of your mission. Another thing that struck me right away was the role that William F. Buckley Jr. played in the founding of this organization. And then finally, the mission that you have, specifically teaching the principles of limited government, free market economics, and honorable leadership. So, so I, I, I'm getting to be an old guy and I'm retiring, so I hope you'll indulge me if I sort of reflect and maybe provide some suggestions for advice for the young people in the room. First, let me talk a little bit about William F. Buckley. I got to know him a little bit, never very well, but I met him on a number of occasions. I was in his company a, a good handful of times. And let me just tell you, he, was, he lived mo one of the most wonderful lived lives of the 20th century. This guy was amazing. Um, to call him a Renaissance man would be to understate it. He was a philosopher. He helped to forge the national political coalition that we know of now as the conservative movement, which has come to be the dominant force in one of the two great political parties of the greatest nation on earth. Um, along the way, by the way, he drove out the racists who wanted to pollute the Republican Party with a noxious philosophy. He was a political candidate. Uh, he, he famously ran for mayor of New York City and upon his announcement speech that was covered by the press and when he finished a reporter immediately said, Mr. Buckley, if you win the election, what is the first thing you're going to do? And he looked at him without a pause and said, demand a recount. He, he founded and edited the most influential conservative magazine of the 20th century, National Review. He hosted Firing Line, the longest running single host public affairs show in television history. He wrote con countless books about political philosophy, about governance, about policy, but also on the side, he was a, a best-selling fiction writer, suspense thrillers. He was an Army veteran. He was an accomplished sailor who crossed the Atlantic in a small boat. He was an accomplished, I mean, concert-level pianist and harpsichordist. This guy was unbelievable. And above all of those things, or at least equal to them, he was just famous for his wit, his civility, and his good nature. He engaged in a robust defense of the principles that we all share, and he did it in a generous way way even with people with whom he strongly disagreed. So my advice, if you haven't already, read his books. Start with God and Man at Yale. It is still relevant 70 years after he wrote it. And follow his example of civility. And, and I know the Fund for American Studies mission includes a focus, well, the mission includes a focus on limited government, free market economics, and honorable leadership. Let me just briefly touch on these. Um, all three, as Senator Sullivan alluded to, all three are constantly being challenged. You could say attacked. These bedrock principles of the greatest society in the history of the world are not to be taken for granted. They don't just stay here permanently because we wish they would. We have to earn them every day. We have to preserve them, and we have to fight to do that. Uh, the importance of limited government is very, very hard to overstate. And remember, it is the nature of government always to expand. It tends to be a one-way ratchet. A new program is created. It doesn't go away. The next one comes along. And, and it's kind of inevitable, right? Humanity 
is imperfect. Humans are imperfect. That is in our nature. And some people think if we just have one more government program, we'll fix what's wrong. They forget that actually the government is populated by flawed humans as well. And very often it makes problems worse. They also forget that government by its nature operates by coercion. And the growth of government necessarily is the diminution of personal freedom. One of the other principles in the mission statement that you guys have is support of free market economies. But let's be honest, there are a lot of people in our midst, in our country, and some of them are, most of them, I'm sure, are well-intentioned. But they think that a government that controls the economy, as long as, long as government's got smart people, will get better outcomes. And they think that despite the vast comprehensive data to the contrary. Uh, there's an illustration that I love because I think it says the whole story in a little anecdote. Julius Caesar lived about 2,000 years before George Washington. That's just an historical fact. It's also an historical fact that they both rode into battle on the same mode of transportation. Because you see, it took about 2,000 years for the Western world to double our standard of living once. And then we developed democratic capitalism. We developed a market economy. And as the market economy was adopted since then, we've been doubling our standard of living every roughly 30 years. That's the difference. The empirical basis is so overwhelming, we've got a powerful moral obligation to defend this enormously successful model. And, and let me close with this. The third of the items on the mission statement is honorable leadership. Now, honor takes so many manifestations. There are so many important character traits that are part of honor, honesty, and integrity, and we know what they are. But right now, we're living in a time that is polarized. A lot of folks are angry. Political discourse tends to be very coarse. And in fact, there are huge numbers of Americans that think that their mission should be to prevent the discourse. It's not enough to disagree. They have to silence people who have a different point of view. In this context, my suggestion, my advice, follow the example of William F. Buckley. Vigorously defend our freedom as the birthright of Americans and try not to impugn the motives of decent, honorable people who see the world differently than we do. Thanks again for this wonderful honor and for this evening tonight. As your program at your table indicates, I'm Randy Teague, the chairman of the Fund for American Studies, and what a great honor it is to be at an event where I know so many people have done so much hard work. I really want to point out that Roger Ream and his team uh, at the Fund, working tirelessly, not for days and weeks, but really for months, has working with you brought about this great success tonight. I also want to thank uh, Kirk Blaylock and Jane Mack and Kathy Russo in particular for this dinner, uh, for the success of it. I want to be brief, and of course, the Board of Trustees and Regents and staff would say, that's the first time we've ever heard that from Randy. Uh, but I have to say, everything has been said almost. So I'm going to add two things. When we think about how smart the human race is, why do historians pretty much agree it took 6,000 years before somebody said, why don't we put wheels on luggage? I mean, stop and think about that for a minute, right? I mean, sometimes the obvious is just too obvious, perhaps. But what I really want to say in a much more serious tone 
is that last evening, right about the same time as this, our students here with us tonight had a very different dinner. Uh, let's call it a buffet dinner of meatballs and vegetarian lasagna or whatever it might have been. Uh, quite different from the dinner we've had this evening. But they had the opportunity to meet with 30 to 40 of the alumni from this organization. The alumni spoke about what they are doing, whom they are, uh, what their relationship to the fund is. But they spoke about what they think are the takeaways from that experience. And it was really deeply rewarding to be a part of that, but it was deeply rewarding to me to watch that in real experiential atmosphere of that dinner. So now we come to tonight, and what Jade has said and what the senators have said is so true that really nothing much more needs to be added except one thing. And Ambassador Jim Culberson, who was George, H, George W. Bush's ambassador to the Netherlands, stood up last night as a trustee and he added something very, very important to that discussion. That is, we talk about networking, which is what we all do, let's face that. But networking is one of those professional terms. It sort of connotes professional relationships. And even though it's 100% true, in fact, it misses something else that is so here with us tonight. It misses the concept of friendship, being friends, being friends when you come to this program, being friends when you become alumni of this program, being friends when you work with other lobbyists on other issues. Friendship, friendship is the glue that helps cement a civilization and is friendship that is under attack all the time by political discussions that pit people against each other in terrifying ways. It really does. So before you run out to get your car, the line is short, it's only 340 people. <laughs> look around the table, look to the left, look to the right, look at the next table, and think of the friendships that are a part of your life. And think of building those friendships further. Thank you. Good night.